gamers, I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragons, we are journeying into the Arkham Files as we take a look at the latest game in that series, Arkham Horror Final Hour. Now, this game is published by Fantasy Flight Games and designed by Carlos A. Rossi. Now, Julie will tell you more about the game itself. It's a cooperative game uh, that plays one to four players intended for ages 14 and above, and plays in 30 to 60 minutes. And I, I think we played mostly 45 minute games, maybe 50. It does have definitely a nice flow to the game, fairly quick. I do think it could go over that 60 minute mark if you were playing with a full four players. Yeah, when we played the four player though, we played it in 45 minutes. Yeah, but you don't have that same banter with multiple people. True. Now, what are you gonna be doing in Arkham Horror Final Hour. Well, you are on the campus of Miskatonic University, and unfortunately, you have failed to stop the stupid or evil or whatever you want to call them cultists from starting a ritual that will summon an ancient one that is going to destroy the world. So it is the world's last hour. What you must do is within eight rounds, you need to move around the map, discovering clues, protecting the ritual location from monsters, defeating monsters, hopefully getting rid of some of those stupid cultists along the way. <laughs> They're just really annoying, aren't they? Yep. And once you've gathered all of your clues, you then need to use your priority cards. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about that in the component section as well as the how to play. You can find those down below in the timestamps if you wanna jump ahead. So once you use those priority cards, if you get the right symbols, two times the current player amount. So for us, it was typically four. When we played the two player, yeah. Yes, eight when we played a four player version in order to stop the ritual and prevent the ancient one from rising up from the sea if it's Cthulhu or coming from someplace else and destroying the world. Did I miss anything? Don't think so. All right, so what time is it, Julie? Well, it's time to grab our drinks. Grab our fellow investigator. And we're going to take it to the table. I'm looking forward to getting this to the table. I like how it's got that board feel to it. The last Arkham Files game we, we played was Elder Sign, which was dice. And it was a fast game too, but it's just something about a board element that I love. I guess we'll see, huh? Now let's take a quick look at the components for Arkham Horror Final Hour. Now we'll start with the rule book. There is a quick reference guide on the back of it, as you can see. Nice art, does try to give you the feel of an old book. You've got a list of components, some nice explanations as to how to play the game. Definitely didn't have any issues going through this. Now, in the back, there are some clarifications for single player as you can play this game by yourself. There are also just some more clarifications for the limitations of components, items, as well as hidden information. And then just a black and white version of the board in case you're finding it a little confusing where the monsters will go. Now, with regards to references as well, we have four reference cards, one for each investigator, that have just a quick summary of a lot of the symbols that you're gonna be seeing in the game. Now let's take a look at the tokens. So here we've got the clue tokens, all double-sided. These are the symbols that you're going to be collecting as you're gonna to need to find out which ones are key to stopping the Ancient One's ritual. Now, here we've got some other circular tokens. This is the ritual token. These are gate tokens, and they are double-sided as there'll be a stack of face-down gates. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about that in the how to play. Next, we have just some health tokens. There's enough for four players to have three health each. This is a seal token where you can seal a walkway and destroy a monster. We have the lead investigator token here. These represent destroyed rooms, so buildings can become destroyed, limiting where you can place the monsters. Now that we're talking about the monsters, let's see what we've got here. So as you can see, the monsters are blue and red. They will move along the blue or the red lines. Don't wor worry, the board uh, is gonna be showing up in just a moment. Some, for example, the ones with the human head will damage players. These other ones will move trying to get into the ritual location as the players will lose the game if it is filled. These ones with the building symbol will destroy areas of the building. That's where these tokens come in. 
making it so that it's more difficult. Now, some are stronger than, than others. As you can see, their health here, this one is three, two, and one. You've got cultists, which are just annoying. They don't really do anything. They just take up room. And another creature that moves around. That might be Amigo. I'm not sure. Now you'll notice there are also some monster tokens here. Now I placed them here is because they go with the ancient ones. These two are for Cthulhu. The other ones go with the corresponding ancient ones. So we've got the cool hordes that go with Enmordoth and the Sothonians that go with should have meant. Now, all of these ancient ones are double-sided, as there are explanations how to set up the monsters based on three different difficulties, easy, normal, and hard, on the back. Now, I'm guessing there's gonna be some expansions that are gonna give us more monsters and more characters. So let's now take a look at the priority cards and the items. So these priority cards are what you're gonna be placing on top of the different action cards. The lower the number is, the better. These omen symbols will trigger different things on the ancient ones. So whenever you're playing the game, there's gonna be four action cards that are played and the who's gonna play what, it will depend on the player count. And you can just see sort of how it works. Nine, eight, 30, there's a total of 30 of these cards. So if you want to trigger a specific action first, and don't worry, we'll clarify why that is during the how to play, you want to play lower cards. Now some of the items that you get here, such as the Tika Hello, you'll discard this item when you would resolve the bottom effect of an action card. So just a little hint as to what's coming. The bottom effects aren't very good sometimes. Now this one, the Crystal of Elder Things, you will discard this item before or after you resolve an action to resolve the following effect two times. You can either repair two damage in any location or an investigator can recover one health. Elder Sign, discard this item after you draw a priority card to draw four additional cards and then discard four cards. Now, as you may have noticed, you do see the symbols on the clue tokens on the priority cards. These are used to stop the ritual, which is why the other sign may come into play during your game and be useful. Now, if you're wondering who these characters are, one thing I neglected to showcase in the rule book, you do get some nice character biographies in the back. Now, I do believe that I know all of them, but I'm gonna try. We've got Rita Young, Tommy Muldoon, Michael Glenn, Ashcan Pete, Jenny Barnes, and Lily Chen. Now these three I know from other Arkham games. Now we'll just take a look at the action cards. So for Jenny Barnes, you have a top and bottom part of the action. Bottom parts are typically move and investigate. However, something negative happens, such as triggering the monsters. The top part typically lets you damage monsters and also do some cool stuff. Maybe even let other investigators damage monsters move. So depending on what you get, you're gonna wanna play the top part of your card. That's where priority order comes in. The first, well, the cards with the highest priority number. So 26 is bad. Typically when a 26 is played, you'd read the bottom. A higher number like a nine would let you read the top part of the card but it all depends on what the other players have. So let's take a look at Ashcan Pete's here. So you may attack monsters adjacent to your location for up to two damage, then move up to two times. Pretty good. His bottom one is move up to one time, investigate, then two monsters spawn. Nothing catastrophic with Lily Chen. So you may move up to one time at the bottom, then you would activate monsters in the orange zone. Don't worry, haven't forgotten to show you the board. You'll see the orange zone. Up here, move up to two times and attack monsters at your location for three, or you may lose one else and attack monsters for 10. Well, she's clearly the powerhouse here. And as you can see, all characters have their own standee. I, I honestly wonder if it would be cool if Fantasy Flight Games made just like Arkham Files miniatures that could be used in every single game. Now let's take a look at Rita Young. So, fairly standard. And all of these characters are a little different. Some of them can move a lot, some of them can do more damage. So she's got a move, attack monsters, then a investigate. Tommy Muldoon has another one here, move it to one time, then activate monsters in the purple zone. So for example, you if you're wondering about seals, how you'd seal a walkway, move it to one time, then attack monsters and an adjacent location for two damage. Then you can seal the walkway, which 
is a great way to defend the ritual site. Then Michael Glenn, last but not least, and it's perfect actually, his card gives a per an example as to what you don't want to see. So at the bottom part, where you would maybe play the item to avoid it, Thirst for the Venge, sorry, Thirst for Revenge, so that way too fast. Damage your location three times. If you cannot place all three damage, tokens lose one health. Then the top part would be move up to one time, then attack monsters at your location for one damage and seal a walkway connected to your location. Typically when you get a card like this, you really want to get your lowest possible priority card out. Now the last thing we have to take a look at is the board. So let's open up the board and don't worry, you'll get to see it in more close up detail when we show you during the setup and how to play. So as you can see, orange, green, purple locations, bottom part of the board is where you're gonna be finding your clue tokens. And it is a board of Miskatonic University. Now with that being said, we're gonna place this back down and we're gonna be right back as we adjust the camera and get everything set up to teach you how to play the game. Now let's take a look at how you set up Arkham Horror Final Hour. We are gonna follow a recommended first game setup, meaning we are facing Cthulhu. Now, for those of you that have played other Arkham Horror games, Cthulhu is normally like the last monster you face, not the easy starting one, but they decided to do something different for this game. Now, in order to do that, we are need to set aside the three star spawns, which we have right here, and the six deep ones. And you'll notice they are yellow monsters. They have their corner cut. That's why they're, they're different from the regular monsters. We will follow the rules for an easy, normal difficulty setup. So we need to then take these gate tokens and you're always gonna start with three gates. So we need to follow the symbol. So we get this gate that's gonna go at sorority row. We then get this gate with the diamond in the science building. And then lastly, we get this gate set up at Dorothy Upman Hall. It also tells us that the ritual location is in the Humanities Building, which is where all of our investigators will start. To tell where your investigator is, you just place them sort of around the building. They don't occupy these, these squares. The squares are for monsters. So we're gonna place them there and we will be teaching this the four player way. Don't worry, I will give you an example as to what you would do with a lower player count. Now, for the rest of the gates, as you'll see we've got a nice mix of different ones. There is a step where we need to open a new gate or, well, reveal something out of this gate stack. So these are all taken, stacked up, and placed right here. This is a priority card discard pile. You can discard your cards there. So don't worry, this is supposed to be next to the board. Now what we then need to do is set up the clue tokens. So we've got our 10 clue tokens there. And then during the components, I realized I did neglect to showcase the three clues that are keys. Those are gonna be getting set up now as well. So I'm gonna set these aside. First, I'm gonna take out all of these 10 clue tokens. We gotta mix them all up. And we drag two of them down here. Now, you can possibly have two of the same type, so keep that in mind. Next, we take these ones with the key. Now the key does represent the items. You mix it all up. And then you just slide it to these different locations on the map, or pick it up however you want to set it up. They're placed everywhere that there is not a gate or the ritual location. All right, so the board is set up. We have our investigators. All of our investigators start with three health. So I'm just going to set it up like this. Should give them enough room. I know we've got a nice big blank spot right there. Don't worry, I have an idea as to what I'm going to place there. Just move this stuff over maybe a little bit or spread it out, I haven't decided yet. In any case, yeah, we'll put it above the cards. 
get everything nicely done. So we have all of our investigators now set up. We need to decide who's gonna be the lead investigator. In this case, I'm gonna pick, just because of where she is, Jenny Barnes. So we give her the lead investigator token. Just so I don't forget anything, I will set up a reference card since I'm gonna be controlling all four of the characters. Well, I'm gonna have it nearby actually because you also need a monster cup. So all the monster tokens taken in and thrown into the monster cup. You can use an actual cup. You can use a Crown Royale bag like you, I've used with uh, Arkham Horror Second Edition. And then you're gonna wanna make sure that that's placed near the table. So I'm gonna use the box top as the game recommends. Set it up there. We've now set up the game. I'm gonna flip over our Ancient One card. And there you have it. I'll try to make sure everything just stays on camera. I'm sure the box might be a little bit off, but it's not the end of the world. So the game is now set up. We are ready to play Arkham Horror Final Hour. So keep it right here as we're gonna dive into the rules explanation for the game. Now let's take a look at how you play Arkham Horror Final Hour. The last thing I need to do is just draw four priority cards for each player. Now, their cards are just going to be slightly behind them and off camera. That was three for Jenny Barnes. So I'm going to deal out the other four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, all of the characters have their cards. Now, as I'm doing this, you know, a four player game, but I'm the only player, I'm gonna do my best to sort of simulate the game. And the one thing I did also neglect to do with the setup, I just went over the basics. I do need to spawn a whole bunch of monsters. So what I need to do for normal, we need to spawn two deep ones in Dorothy Upman Hall. That's three deep ones. And then lastly, we need to spawn two monsters at each location except the ritual location. So I forgot about that. I was just focused on setting up the board. So we're just gonna start placing these guys and try to make sure they're all orientated properly. We've got some of the nasty guys out right away. Oof. Lots of guys that, oh, guys and gals, can't really tell, they're monsters, so. Creatures that need to be destroyed. I think that is probably the best way to put it. And to teach the game, what I'm going to be doing is, we're gonna go through two turns. Now, the game is fairly difficult in terms of letting me like play like multiple rounds to show you everything that the game has to offer. But I do think that going through two different rounds of the game should provide us with a nice enough variety, trigger enough events to give everyone a good idea as to what they'll be doing during the gameplay. So now that I just did the last part of setup, let's get this show on the road. So we're gonna start with the lead investigator, Jenny Barnes. Now, you can go for simultaneous play. You don't have to. The way that it does work, though, is that you cannot discuss strategy until you have played and revealed your priority card. So you're not going to be discussing with other players. Obviously, that's not going to work very well for me because I know what I'm wanting going. Sorry, I know what I want to do with all of these different characters. So let's take a look at Jenny Barnes. So her card is move up to one time, then in turn order, each investigator attacks monsters at his or her location for equal to, for damage equal to twice the number of party, <coughs> party cards he or she's played this round. Now this is a good card. We're all stuck in that location. So it's not really gonna come into play. So for all intents and purposes, since I know what the cards are, I'm just gonna place them on the top and pick a priority card. And as this isn't a great one, and I don't want a lot of omen symbols, I'm gonna pick number 25 to get this to go last, and then I'm gonna draw a new priority card. 
That is a great card, just not at the start of the game. Now let's take a look at Lily Chen. So she may <clears throat> move up to one time, then attack monsters at your location for two damage. Then move up to one monster at your location to an empty space at an adjacent location. That's pretty good. There's definitely stuff that we can do with that. Let's take a look at our priority cards. She's got a four, 28, 21, and a five. In this case, I will want her to go potentially use that ability. We'll draw then another priority card. We will take a look at Ashcan Pete. So move up to two times and reveal the top card of the item deck and investigator of your choice gains that item. That is a very good card. So let's see what we can do to get that played. Oof, we don't have great options. So we're gonna play 12, draw another card. Now, the reason playing 12 is a good idea is that that is implying to the last player that you want to go with the top of your card. Now, every player's gotta make the decisions based on what their cards are. So in this case, you may move up to one time, then attack monsters at any location in your zone. So that's anywhere in your zone for up to two damage. Well, we've got some pretty nasty guys that we may want to kill. This, this is a good card. Let's see what we got. We've got a 2, 14. Yeah, like, this is just a no-brainer. We've got this guy that destroys stuff. He's got to go. So, we'll then place that. Now, what do we do? There's going to be a discard for the priority card. It's just going to be off-camera here. We reveal the card. So, as we said with Tommy Muldoon, it is... Move up to one time, then attack monsters at any location in your zone for up to two damage. So the zone he wants to be in is orange. Actually, no, sorry. It is the green zone. So we're going to move to the quad as there's no enemies that can damage us there. And as this is in the green zone, we're going to defeat this monster. This card is now discarded. And this goes in a discard pile that is going to be just off camera next to the box. So that is his turn. We then draw card number four. Ah. Before I forget, you place your discarded cards here so you'll keep track of the omens. So we're gonna look at Lily Shen. So she may move up to one time, then attack monsters at your location for up to two damage. And then we may move up to one monster at your location into an empty space. So where do we want to get rid of monsters for up to two damage? Well, ideally we want to be able to defeat this guy somehow eventually. So we're going to get rid of this guy. We can move this guy into an adjacent space. So maybe we want to push him to where there's the museum into the green zone where he might be a little less problematic. Now, if our players here do have cards that trigger the green zone, well, we're not allowed to talk about it or discuss it. Next, we're gonna trigger number 12. So we may move up to one time, then investigate your location. As this is the third card going, we go with the bottom. Then we must activate all monsters in the orange zones. So I'm just gonna leave that out for a second. We'll place this here. So we may move up to one time and then investigate. Well, we've got a guy on the quad. We need to start looking for these symbols. I'm actually going to go this way to Fraternity Row, reveal the token, it's the Hourglass symbol which then takes that spot on the board. We must now activate all monsters in the orange locations. So this is a red monster, it has the arrow which means that it moves, so it'll move along the red path which is here. This monster moves along the red path. Now actually technically, we did that incorrectly. So. That's actually a good mistake to make. You want to go by lowest to highest. So we would start with Elder Face Seminary. Nothing. Humanities. Nothing. Please note that monsters cannot leave the ritual location unless they are a specific type of monster that can. We then activate the athletics facility, which means he moves one, two. Actually, wait, no. He moves into here. There is, as there is, room. Now that this has been full, he would move one, and then a second time along the path into Sorority Row. We get the guy from Fraternity Row that moves into Sorority Row. And we've now activated all of the monsters. 
We then reveal the last card, Jenny Barnes's card, and I'm just going to discard that one as well. So what we have is move up to one time and then at investigate your location, activate monsters in the orange zone. So once again, it's monsters in the orange zone. Well, as it's the orange zone, we'll move into the quad. We'll investigate here. We find a diamond. We activate the orange monsters, meaning this guy jumps from sorority row into the student union, from fraternity row into sorority row. I know I did that out of order, but as I just moved them, those are literally the only two monsters that are going to move. And as you can see, it didn't disrupt anything. Now, our players have moved. We now need to go into the Ancient One phase. So what we need to do is take our priority cards. We total up how many Omen symbols there are. There are two. We then will follow the corresponding effect on the Ancient One card. In this case, we will activate each Deep One in any order, then spawn two Deep Ones at the gate. Well, we have to activate the Deep Ones. They are blue, so they actually move. To this location so they are at sorority row we then spawn two deep ones again at the gate you notice that this is a very quick path for them to get into the ritual location so killing them getting rid of those monsters is a top priority now the last thing we need to do is we draw the gate token unfortunately it's the gate at dorothy upman hall we must now spawn monsters according to the number of tokens there are there are two so we spawn this guy and that guy. And there you have it. We have now completed this round. We will pass the lead investigator token over to Lily Chen. And we will start again. So as you can see, this is really going to be the flow of the game. You're trying to find the clues in order to resolve it. So we're going to play one more full round of the game. And then afterwards, we'll have cut and I'll come back. And we'll just talk about how you can end and win the game. So let's keep going now. Start with Lily Chen. So we've got move up to two times and attack monsters at your location for three damage, or you may lose one else to attack for up to 10. Now, that's really good. I definitely want this to happen. We want to get rid of this guy in Miskatonic Museum. Fortunately, we're at the Elder Faith Seminary, and there is no way for us to get over to Dorothy Upman Hall or up to Sorority Row. So this is a good card for us. We'll place it face down, reveal her priority cards. Her best one is five, so we will play five. Now at this point, you also want to start watching your symbols. Stuff that you have here may or may not be useful. If you do have two symbols of the same type, you know they're not one of the tokens here, so you're going to want to try to spend them. We'll draw another one. There we go. So we now continue on to Ashcan Pete. Move up to two times and resolve one at the following your location. So one of the following effects, attack monsters at your location for three. We can get rid of some deep ones. That's a good one. We're probably going to want to go with that one. Once again, we've got some low numbers. Unfortunately, being the second player to play, it doesn't really give the other players a lot of information as to what I'm trying to do. Let's take a look at Mr. Muldoon. So move up to two times and repair your location two times. That's pretty good. But unfortunately, there's nothing that needs to be repaired. Damage your location in each adjacent location one time. This is a terrible card to have right now. Let's take a look. And I neglected to draw a card for him. So technically, as he was the last one, we're just going to shift it. He should have had the number one in his hand. And Ashcan Pete's, I believe, doesn't really matter, number 18, well, I think it was 18 in any case. I believe it was 22 or the 27 I pulled should have gone to Lily Chen. Just showing you how to do it properly because, as you can see, drawing your priority cards after you play them does affect the order. You know, it's a slight mistake, but it's not that big of a deal. So we would have had this. And this is the kind of card where, if I didn't know what other people were doing, I m would definitely try to play this as a high priority. But we've got some nasty things going on, so I would also potentially play it, 
but there are no damage locations. If I had at least a damage location, this would be the way to play it. But gotta be risky, it's Arkham. Not sure if I want it to go. I'll save the one, I'll play the 14 on it. Now lastly, we gotta look at Jenny Barnes. So she may move up to one time, then attack monsters at your location for two, then choose another investigator in your zone. That investigator attacks monsters at his location for two. That seems like a very strong card at this point in the game. We've got some great stuff we can do. So we'd want to get that off. We'll draw another priority card. And now we move into resolving everything, which means we're gonna go with Jenny. So I place this properly on the board, reveal the card. So move up to one time, then attack monsters at your location for two. So we're going to move one time. Oh, is there anything we can destroy? Ah, yes. Gonna move one time. We're gonna get rid of this guy that can destroy buildings. So you may choose another investigator in your zone, so in the green zone, that only leaves us with Thomas Muldoon, who may attack monsters for up to two. We've got two monsters worth one. Get rid of both of them. Goodbye. Next, we're gonna go to number five, Lily Chen. So she may move up to two times and attack for three. So she's only gonna move once. This is up to two times, and we wanna get this guy out of the game. Well, it's not out of the game. If you do run out of monsters, if the cup ever becomes empty, you take your monsters that are here, all your discarded ones, and throw them back in the cup. So next, we resolve Thomas Muldoon, and this is our terrible card. So damage your location in each adjacent location one time. So we've got, boom. Boom, boom. Yeah, not good because we also damaged the Ritual Center, so we really would have maybe wanted to play the one, but this also lets me show you what happens when you damage locations, which would have also happened if these guys had triggered any of the ones with the building symbol. And that's his turn, not very good. Lastly, we get Mr. Ashcan Pete. So you may move up to one time and then investigate your location. Because he wants to investigate, the only place he can investigate, can investigate the gate, doesn't resolve anything. He's gonna move down to the athletic facilities. He reveals an item. So we get the item token, this gets discarded. We'll draw the item and it may or may not be played right away. So discard this item before or after you resolve an action. To seal any three walkways, place those seals with their gray side face up. A little weak, but we can seal some walkways. That is gonna be fantastic. So we're going to end up doing that. However, notice it's before or after resolving action. We are in the process of resolving the action. Now it's not quite clear, but I do believe we should finish everything. First, we'd have to activate all the monsters in the orange zone. Meaning, this guy moves, this guy would move, and then end up in the Humanities Building. Next, we've got this guy that ends up moving red. It's full, jumps over here, jumps into the Science Building. Now, as we finish resolving the action, we can spend the item, which I will do. We're gonna seal walkways that are adjacent to us. Three walkways, we really want to make it more difficult for any monsters coming in. So we've got some seals out there. Now seals will work twice. They instantly destroy a monster if their yellow side is up, one time on the gray side. So for example, if this had been like this first time, he would have died, it would have gone like this. But all in all, not in a terrible situation, but not in a great situation. And there you have it. We must now continue playing. Now, as we said in the intro, the game lasts eight rounds before you have to try to win the game. On your eighth round, if you're still alive, 
you will need to guess to see what this is. Now we've just completed our second. Let's go through the ancient one phase. We've got a total of four this time. So we refer to what's four on the omen track. So the lead investigator loses one health. After that, the next turn, all investigators must play their priority cards face down, meaning you would not be able to tell players what the numbers are. You got to play them face down. And there you have it. I think we've done a good explanation as to how you would play Arkhamora Final Hour. So with that being said, we're going to take a quick cut and then we're going to come back with the last sequence as we explain how you can win the game. Now, how would you win Arkham Horror Final Hour? So let's move some stuff around quickly. Imagine it's a game being played in fast forward. We're moving around. We're investigating the board. People are finding stuff. Stuff's going our way a little bit here. Things, we're having a good time. We're not losing. We've got a whole slew of stuff that we found out. We've killed a bunch of monsters. Maybe not everything went our way. Some guys got it, got into the humanities building. We lost a few seals. Found some items. So this is a great item, just to give you an example. Maybe a result of falling effect two times. It's one of the only ways you can heal another player. You could heal them twice. And it's the falling effects two times. Just double check in action card to resolve the following effect two times. So yeah, sorry, this is the or part. I got that mistaken. So yes, you can heal twice. Be one of the ways to heal Lily Shen. So you could heal and then also repair two locations. Huh. Investigator's just doing some good stuff. Lily found some more information. But somehow there's a lot of stuff that didn't necessarily go our way. Few players are wounded. We're about to potentially lose the game. Now, the way investigators will lose the game is if the humanities location is filled with monsters, and that would make more sense. It's a desperate situation if that guy, if we had a deep one right there. So this situation, we're about to lose the game. We don't have all of the information that we need, which is fine. I want to explain how we'd lose. Also, before someone mentions it, yes, I did skip the gate phase on the second part of the how to play. So just correcting one thing on the second part of the how to play, we would have had to spawn two more monsters at the gate. And actually, you know what? We'll move that guy. He actually would have potentially gotten into the humanities building. So some people have been defeated but just want to make sure we're caught up to speed, kind of play through a bunch of stuff and fast forward. And we're now on our final turn. Things didn't go so well, we didn't get all the information, but you know what, we are ready to guess and try to win the game. Uh, so we're gonna lose, if any investigator's health goes down to zero, we shall lose the game. Also, if this location is filled up or destroyed, the ritual location, we will lose the game. The only way for us to win the game is by figuring out how to stop the ritual. So as it says, you've got all the details on the back of the rule book and then how you can reverse the ritual. Now, the way to reverse the ritual is you gotta go with your best guess and you need to commit priority cards based on what it would be. So sometimes you might wanna play longer Right now, in terms of what Jenny can contribute, maybe a clover, maybe an hourglass, two hourglasses. And we may not win in this scenario, but I want to give an example. It's the end of the turn. We've resolved, let's say, we're about to resolve Cthulhu, whether the only way you need to fully resolve this at the end of the round is if there's a chance you will lose the game. So we want to just look at the winning conditions. Each investigator may commit three cards to the attempt. To win, you must have two times the amount of investigators. We need a total of eight successes. So this is what Jenny's going to contribute. If we're looking at the scenario here, no diamonds. We've got two clovers. We'll commit a star anyway, because that's all that 
Chen can contribute. So that's her contribution. Take a look at Ashcan Pete, and I neglected to draw a card. His case, we've got literally nothing that he can contribute. He'd still contribute three anyway. And we've got Clovers and Moons, Hourglass. Got to take a gamble here. Good chance it could be a Clover, maybe. We'll throw that in. Next, we reveal the cards and we compare the amount of successes we have to the amount of players. So stars are useless. We have one success, two successes. Three, four, Five successes, we would need eight, we would lose the game. This is not the ideal situation to attempt that type of thing. However, if we had a little bit more luck, a little bit better cards, we may have been able to win the game. So that's how you test. That's really the last thing that I wanted to go over. But one other thing that I did not want to skip over is what we would do in a situation, and I'm just gonna use the priority cards that I currently have, is if this was, let's say, a two-player game. We are going to take out Uli Chen and Ashcan Pete. Each player in a two-player game would have five health. They would also end up playing two priority cards. So at this point, you'd play one, I'm not gonna go over it, the side on the sequence. Tommy Muldoon would play as well too. I'll just leave this one at the top. We'll just play some priority cards randomly on here just to give you an idea as to what would happen. And then we would resolve the cards in order. Now, once you have played a face down priority card, you can start talking strategy, meaning things change a little bit in a two-player game, as you're very much going to be potentially attacking monsters, investigating, attacking monsters, investigating. So keep that in mind. Now, if you were playing a three-player game, the player that is the lead investigator would go two times. So for example, if we had Lily Chen in here, you would get rid of, I'll just do this, you would get rid of Thomas Muldoon's card and We'd have a Lily card in there. As Jenny's elite investigator, she would play twice. When it would then pass on to Lily Chen, she would then play twice, and so on and so forth. And there you have it. That's our overview as to how you would play Arkham Horror Final Hour. Now keep it right here as Julie and I are going to be coming back at you with our review of the game. So Arkham Horror Final Hour. What did you think of the game? Now... For those that want to know, you can find our review of Elder Sign. Ah, uh, should I make it pop up in front of your head? Yes, it'll pop up in front of her head. And I know that you also... <laughs> no! <laughs> I know you also played Arkham Horror, the second edition, but we only played that like one time a long time ago. <laughs> Back when Sammy G was still on this with you. Yeah, we decided to play one day. We thought about reviewing it, but it just didn't quite happen. So in any case, what did you think of the game? I enjoyed it. I we had fun. We um, there was definitely some easy easy plays that we did, and some that weren't so easy. So I mean, there's a good balance there. Well, the first play that we did, we did we neglected the gate mechanic the first time. That was my bad. But I don't it, think it, it would really have made. Is. It's his job to read the rules. <laughs> I don't think it necessarily would have affected uh, our outcome. No, probably not but we just won it way too heavily. Um, so I enjoy that there's a bunch of female characters in this. Uh, I had to, I got to play all three, uh, so that was fun, and uh, then got to play two of them together when we played the four-player version. Um, I think they're all three of them are pretty good. Um, for my style of play, I really enjoy the, um, the socialite and... I can't remember what... Rita Young, the athlete, or did you prefer Lily Chen, the child of destiny? The... Yeah, well, Lily Chen, I just didn't remember what she was. I just <laughs> knew she had she would meditate and do some cool stuff like spiritually. <laughs> but uh, um, honestly, I enjoyed both of them probably more than the, the athlete. The athlete is not my style of play to just run around the board. Uh, for some reason, I never enjoy that. Even with Imperial Assault. We no, still... you... 
She hates running around the board. Even if it's the thing that we need to do, even if they get the objective, she'd rather murder everything. <laughs> I'd rather feel active instead of just running around. It, anyways, so... That's why you didn't like Star Saga. <laughs> okay, so I, I enjoyed those two female characters. I enjoyed their abilities. I thought they were both pretty good. Uh, if you enjoy running around a board, you'll enjoy uh, Rita Young, the athlete, athlete as well. It's not that she's not... Uh, uh, as doesn't her powers aren't as good that she has some cool stuff as well i just didn't enjoy running around everywhere um i also i mean there's there was two different um well there's more than two different scenarios but there's two different monsters there's three different monsters we played twice against cthulhu using two players we then played against and i'm probably gonna get this wrong i'm not that well versed in lovecraftian lore it was Unmordus or Whichever I one. I didn't enjoy that one. That one was <laughs> the one with the monsters that can't be killed. Yes, the ghoul hordes that were running around. Yeah, I have a problem with monsters that can't be killed. And I guess maybe that's one of the reasons because I played Rita against those as well. And I, it just drives me nuts. To me, it's not possible that something can't be killed. So it just annoys me. But we won it anyways. That one was probably the hardest play that we had. Yeah, it, it's, it's just hard to manage, um, you know, these, for me, those ghouls that can move either one, two, or three, depending on where you end up. Uh, so you always have to plan for the worst. And the board's not that big. So it's hard to be three away from something and still attain their objective and not say, I'm going to get these out of our way. You know, yeah. that to me was more frustrating. But I enjoyed the objective. I like the challenge with that scenario. I'm not going to lie. Well, it's maybe not the most fun. I do feel that it's it was... fun. <laughs> I, I at least I'm going to go on record saying I didn't think this one was fun I liked it because I think strategically it worked that being said I do understand your frustration coming from a two player game with the amount of movement you're going to be doing in a two player game because you're going to be typically killing monsters and then moving it can be a lot more challenging than in a four-player game where you can straight up be like, well, I'm just going to avoid it by moving here. So but I do think you get players, a total... But though, I, I would disagree with you, though, that with four players, there's always going to be a player that's going to be close, given the size of the board, that's going to be close to the monsters. And they only have three health. And these monsters, you know, at least when we were playing, were two together, so they do two damage. Yeah, but they only follow a certain path. There's definitely ways to avoid them. Yeah. Except they're on the path of our objectives as well. Not all the time. In any case, I do enjoy uh, the mechanics and the way the game plays. I, I think it was it was uh, it was fun. There's some things that you know add some challenge to it, like when uh, you have to play your priority cards uh, face down. That made it a little bit more frustrating. And at the beginning, the fact that you can't talk when you're putting your cards down made it feel not too cooperative. But it's still a cooperative game cooperative game so uh, I enjoyed it for that yeah, it just has that concealed information aspect where you've got to really pay attention to what person the per sorry the people are playing in terms of priority cards to see and then make your judgment that's yeah, sometimes the game is a lot of a judgment call because sometimes you don't know maybe you really want to go because you've got a great card and maybe someone's trying to go first or at least trigger those top two actions because the bottom part of their card is terrible. And sometimes you just can't communicate the fact that you really need that card to go first, but only if all the priority cards you have are high numbers, making them low priority. Yes. Which happened quite a few times. But that's one of the challenges of the game, and I actually like it. I thought I wouldn't like it. Overall, I liked it because of the, the speed and the overall pacing of the game. It doesn't feel like it slows it slows you down also everything that you do is pretty useful i believe there's one or two cards in every deck that has just that like terrible result at the bottom yeah, i of think it. i think there's two yeah that's per, what i think as deck. well um so i mean for that i mean the one thing for me that i would say and you'll probably disagree with me but from um the, those tokens with the monsters aren't huge and to me uh there wasn't a huge amount of difference between the look of the monsters i couldn't really tell the difference the symbols on them to say what kind of monster whether they stay put whether they move or whether they attack buildings or or, investigators. or just cultists and take up room yeah <laughs> uh that that to me was clear but the type of monster on it i was like i can't tell what this is 
Uh, so I know you read the the book. Maybe it's explained more clearly there. But I would have enjoyed something a little bit clearer to know what type of monsters you're facing. <laughs> like some of them look pretty similar. No, oh, well, I would agree. The reason why it's set up like that is sort of a throwback to Argamora Second Edition, because in Second Edition it is all of the tiles for the monsters you're pulling them from the bag. The difference is is that you typically know what you're pulling because there's just more information given on the cards, what you're spawning, what's coming out. Some stuff is random, but it's also titled. And I do believe there is just a little bit more lore available in the Arkham Horror Second Edition book. Now it's been probably, well, it's been at least a year since I looked, probably more, a few more years than that since I actually looked for, <clears throat> excuse me, some Lovecraftian lore in there. But I do have to agree with you that it's hard to tell them apart. If you know Arkham Files, if you know Cthulhu in and out, you'll recognize those monsters. You're going to enjoy seeing them. But I do have to agree with you, I would have liked to have the name of the monsters on there just because, I mean, for those of you that watched their full How to Play, I'm saying like these guys, instead of saying like the Migo, the Thessonian, the only ones that I think I know the names for are the ones that uh, came with the, uh, the monsters, with the ancient ones, because we got the Star Spawns, the Deep Ones, Thessonians are the other ones, and the Cool Hordes. I'd say the other thing I'd say is I did enjoy the, the uh, investigator art and I liked that the fact that their um, abilities does go with the type of people. So the socialite was doing things that were socialite, uh, you know, and, and obviously the athlete was running, you know, and she was doing things that basically were like related to marathon running or sprinting or things like that. So I thought that was that was cool. That was a nice touch. Anything else to say? No, I think that was it. So I will now add my thoughts on the game. I gotta say, I really enjoy Arkham Horror Final Hour. One of the reasons I was very eager to get this game, also why we have got this review out so quickly, as well as the unboxing, which we'll be linked back to at the end of the video, is I started sort of with Arkham Horror Second Edition. Like there was a few modern board games I played, but that was the game that sort of brought me into gaming. I love playing co-op. I love working together. It was something that we did on our university like game nights and that typically was the game that we always played. We had such a blast with it. The investigators, the characters are all very memorable. Everyone is uh, a standout. I was sort of disappointed that we don't see the character in there but one of my favorites, Private Eye Joe Diamond. Right? I re remember him because I'd play him. My roommate Maddie would play him. Like, he was just always good. There was also the uh, the researcher, Mandy, and I'm drawing a blank on the last name. But the characters stood out. And having a quick version of essentially Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, something that I could take out, tear down, and, you know, play. Actually, I would say, if you include, like, set up and tear down, it probably is, like, a full hour for a two-player game. And it's something that I always wanted. Also, the game is... Simple. You have to read the cards. Once you get an idea of what the flow of the game is, you can pretty much teach this to anyone. I know that when I was teaching it to Julie, she was a little confused, but then after about like the first turn, it was kind of like, oh, I got this now. And I gotta say, that's something that I always appreciate in games is something that can be taught fairly easily. Now, agreeing with Julie, I love the art. The art for the monsters is very good, just too tiny for it to come through. I do really enjoy the art of the ancient ones. It's a little disappointing that they're only like half the half the sheet. The Cthulhu art is fairly impressive, but we don't get to see all of it. The standees are something that I do like, but going back to what Julie said about the, the monsters, I would really love if Fantasy Flight came out with some like Arkham Files miniatures, just Generic minis for all of these games that you could use in Elder Sign, Arkham Horror 3rd, 2nd Edition. I believe there are some minis for Arkham Horror 3rd, but not 100% sure. Use them in this game as well. It'd be kind of cool, just a nice, neat add-on that you can get. It'd be easier for them to sell because it can fit, like, what, like five or six different games? So, my favorite part about the game, I would say, is the choices. Like when it comes to a priority card, also what priority cards you're gonna use because those omen symbols are nasty. And even the ones that are just one and two can trigger some very negative effects. So you do have to take that into account as well. 
So there's a lot of agency and the concealed information does really go a long way towards combating sort of any type of alpha gamer mechanic. That being said, of course, like if there's a best course of action, it may come out after you've made your decisions and people are free to discuss. But that's something that's definitely mitigated by the game mechanics itself, which is always a good thing to have in a co-op game. But I think we've talked enough about it. You've got a lot of my thoughts just through my interactions with Julie. Overall, I say I like the game. I like the mechanics. Uh, just thinking about mechanics, one thing that we did not discuss. What did you think of the game mechanic and the challenge with regards to monsters that can destroy areas of the buildings? Well, it didn't really come into... I mean, it, they didn't really come in except for our second playthrough, I think, where the monsters were basically destroying a bunch of buildings and you had the ability to... Uh, to uh, Repair, repair them. them? Yeah, that was very lucky. <laughs> but it never really affected in the sense that we had already investigated or we didn't need to investigate, so it didn't really cause much problem for us. No, I do think it's a cool thing that can happen. Uh, for those of you that fully watched the How to Play, I did draw a card with the character Tommy Muldoon that forced me to damage buildings. You can see just how devastating that can be because he damaged five buildings at once. Yeah, it's not... Uh, wasn't very cool, so that's one of the things that I do like about the game is it's got all these different ways of challenging you and pushing you towards making some difficult decisions. And before I give my final thoughts on the game, we did not discuss the difference between two and four players. Well, we talked about it a little bit. So when you're, when you're playing the four player, you have less health. Um, but you also have less control over the game, I find, um, because when you're playing two player, you have you get to play two of your cards, so you can kind of have a plan of action for what you want to do. Um, and to a to a lesser extent, when you're playing the f um, four player, two, when you're playing two players playing four characters, or the, so it would be the same thing playing the four player version of the game because we did not discuss our priority cards at all. We just played it as was written in the rule book. But I still found that you have less of an option for trying to plan out because of how your priority cards are. You have two different sets of priority cards. So it was easier, at least I felt it was easier to have a handle on the game uh, or could feel like you control the game more when you play two player. I also felt four player felt a little bit more rushed. Uh, like there was, it felt less like we had the game under control, um, but it just went a lot quicker. Yeah, I, I think the four-player game actually felt more thematic to me in terms of it being like Arkham in the final hour. It's like, oh my God, we screwed up. The ritual's going on. We have to stop it. And at the end, we had to make a decision. We're like, well, we're, we're in a tough spot. Do we go for it? Let's go for it. Because we had investigators that were like half dead, beat up. So that part was really cool and I enjoyed it. But I do agree with you. When you're playing with just two players, two like one character you've got a more methodical approach to the game. But that's a neat aspect of it because depending on what you're feeling, if you're playing it with just, you know, her and I are playing it, we can play with two characters or with four characters and get a totally different feel. Mm -hmm. So what would you rate Arkham uh, Horror? Nope, nope, I'm throwing it back on you this time. You're, you're throwing gonna... it back on me? Yeah, you're going to give your rating first. So for a little bit of nostalgia's sake, because it's been quite a while since I was in university, and I do like the fact that... Did you just call yourself old? No, but it's been quite a while. So <laughs> there's still a little bit of nostalgia involved there. Like I said, it's Arkham Horror 2nd, not 3rd edition that I played in university. I gotta give this game an 8. It's solid, it accomplishes everything that it sets out to do. I will be taking this definitely to some game nights. And it's the kind of game that I can see a lot of my friends wanting to play and wanting to play multiple times. This is definitely a game that'll be a staple on our shelf and something that'll probably come out fairly often. Uh, it's a seven for me. Uh, it was fun, I enjoyed it, uh, I appreciate it. It's not, uh, dare I say, in my top 10, <laughs> but I did, I did enjoy it. No, and I can see that, like I said, I've got that connection to the characters. Like, I, re I remember the social, like Jenny Barnes from when people were playing her in Arkham or a second edition. One day when we've got some time to kill over the winter, maybe when, when we're on break, we'll dig out Arkham Horror 2nd Edition and do a review or a play of it and talk about it in some way, shape, or form on the channel. Sounds good. 
So I think on that note, it's time to remind you that you can like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell to be notified when we have some new content. Because like this week, sometimes it happens that Jason decides to release three videos. So if you want to know, <laughs> hit the bell and you'll get not notified. Yes. So just talking about that briefly, we've got a lot of stuff shipping. Just got the notification that in December, January, we have like a bunch more stuff that's going to be arriving. So trying to push through some expansions that we have, shorter form content, easier to produce, as well as making sure that for those games that we do have unboxings that we've been getting, some of them do well, some of them do okay. We do want to get those out as well. That's why you're seeing the three videos. Now enough of that. Down below in the video description, you can find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You want to know what we're doing, potentially what showed up in the mail and is going to be featured in an unboxing soon. Well, you can find pictures of that at all of those places. You want to see us playing the game, well, you may not see us, but at least the state of the board, you'll find that there as well. Also popping up in front of Julie and I will be links to some of our previous videos. I thought about doing Elder Sign. It's connected to too many videos. That's why it popped up in front of her face at the start of the video. We got a link back to our Arkham Horror Final Hour unboxing. For those of you that want to see just, you know, what is really in the box. Maybe you just skipped over the components, saw the review, prefer unboxings. It's there for you. Also a link back to our latest release, which will always be changing week to week. So on that note, it's time to grab our drinks. Grab our fellow investigator or best friend. He, best friend, yes. saver of the world. Well, I don't. Oh, I guess it's kind of funny when you look at the cover. The first play we had Jenny Barnes and uh, Thomas Muldoon. They look pretty close there. Okay. And we're gonna keep playing games. I'm gonna keep playing games. I'm really surprised you like the Arkham Horror and the these Arkham File games. You like the other side, you like this one. You even enjoyed second edition, but typically you're not the horror girl. No, but I also like the scent. Yeah, well that's fantasy. That's like... It's monsters. Yeah, you always like watching people kill monsters. I you am an X-Files girl, that's true. Yes, and you really enjoyed... Got lots of grief for Gears of War. I was playing Lord of the Rings, hacking up orcs. And probably more blood in Lord But it wasn't that awful chainsaw. It's the chainsaw that got me. Suffice it to say, she pretends to be a delicate flower. She's not. I didn't say it was a delicate flower. Pretend. No. Only to your parents. No.